Good morning and good afternoon. My name is John Herbst and I run the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. We have a wonderful event for you today, Russia's Quiet Chance for Change at the Ballot Box. This event we are doing with our partners from the Future of Russia Foundation, whose support is essential to make this happen. And during this event, Yulia Taranova will present a report from the Dossier Center. Now I will turn things over to the moderator, Dylan Miles Primakov, a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. He's also a program manager at the Free Russia Foundation. Dylan, over to you. Thank you. Uh, Good morning or good time of the day wherever you are. Uh, Thank you everyone for joining us. Uh, I think we've got a really exciting event this morning. Um, And I would encourage all of our audience members to ask questions as we go. We're gonna try and make the most of the Zoom format. So please feel free to jump in with questions anytime. Uh, Joining us this morning, we have uh, Yulia Taranova, who is director of the Social Sciences Lab and has written uh, a fascinating report on the state of municipal elections in Russia for the Dossier Center. Uh, We have Dr. Ella Paniak, who is a docent at the Higher School of Economics, Anastasia Burakova, who is a chair of Open Russia, also a member of the United Democrats Project, and uh, last but not least, we have Dr. Larry Diamond, a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution and the Freeman Spoli Institute at Stanford University. Um, so I'm going to start off by turning things over to Yulia, but as I said, uh, we'll be taking questions throughout. So you can uh, submit questions uh, through the Q&A form at any time, and I will be pulling out interesting questions. and. Uh, posing them to the panelists as mm-hmm. we go. So uh, as, let's jump right in. Uh, Yulia, let's start with you. Uh, if you could maybe start with an overview of mm-hmm. the findings of your report and what you think the significance of that is. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dylan. Thank you, everyone, and uh, good afternoon. It is my true pleasure and uh, honor to present uh, the report of uh, Dossier Center. Um, and to speak about municipal elections in Russia today. Um, Let me start with a little bit of a background, if you don't mind, because I don't know what our audience uh, is uh, today. Uh, So elections in Russia, they happen at uh, different layers. Uh, The highest layer is presidential, obviously. Then we have uh, state Duma or the state parliament elections. Uh, Then uh, gubernatorial elections or elections of uh, heads of uh, regions. Uh, then city mayors, and then municipal uh, elections, and they are split into different groups. Uh, So we have uh, municipal uh, urban areas, we have municipal uh, rural areas, and uh, other types of local local government. And uh, I think um, only Moscow and St. Petersburg uh, ever got to international news, um, and uh, Moscow and St. Petersburg, both, both cities are treated as subjects of uh, of federation not as uh, cities um, and they are most studied cases so with the report that i'm presenting uh today uh we wanted to fix this uh, uh knowledge gap and to speak about uh russian regions uh, in a wider sense so we analyzed uh over 68,000 uh, uh electoral campaigns and elections uh, which happened over 15 years and uh, included uh, about uh, a million uh, participants. Uh, some of them participated uh, more more than one time uh, in the elections. And uh, to give you a little bit of a of a of a historical background, uh, it's important to mention that um, after the Soviet Union uh, collapsed um, after 1991. Uh, we had direct elections of uh, regional governors. And I remember my parents voting for Moscow region, Moscow region governors. Uh, but I never got to vote because uh, in 2004, when I was in high school, direct elections uh, were abolished uh, and a so-called power vertical was introduced uh, when a president would appoint a, a regional governor. And that was that happened in the aftermath of um, uh, terrorist attacks in Beslan, and uh, um, when there was a sentiment that the federal government was losing control over certain uh, southern republics, uh, southern territories of Russia. 
in 2011, uh, direct elections after civil, after civil unrest and after after Russians took uh, to the streets to protest against the government, direct elections were brought back, but with a little um, with a, a little twist. Uh, the twist is a, a so-called municipal filter, which means that uh, candidates uh, to participate in uh, regional elections uh, must collect about 10% of uh, signatures of municipal deputies uh, from uh, three quarters of, uh, of a region's municipal districts. And uh, this is effectively um, this effectively means that uh, direct uh, elections were never introduced. And let me show you why. Mm -hmm. Yes, if we look at this, uh, if we look at this uh, slide, uh, we can see that uh, the United Russia Party, the official party, the party of the official power in Russia, uh, takes a massive share of uh, overall elected municipal deputies. And this means that uh, not a single, not a single uh, uh, regional governor can be elected without uh, backing uh, from the United Russia. Uh, this, uh, this kind of makes it all uh, absolutely, uh, the, the, absolutely uh, the gubernatorial elections uh, fully controlled by the, uh, by the official power. Um, and uh, the the thing is, uh, uh, independent parties, uh, parties other than United United Russia, are simply not participating uh, in municipal elections. They feel uh, disincentivized. They don't believe in the in their success, and they just don't uh, nominate candidates. So, uh, largely, it uh, justifies that the political uh, the whole political party system in Russia is rather formal, or as we called it, uh, semi-fictional uh, in its character. It's not the real political uh, competition. However, it is, not, uh, it is not really hard to register candidates. If you look at this, uh, at this graph, um, uh, uh, so successful uh, uh, candidates uh, are getting registered if we don't um, if we, if we, uh, if we don't consider the Yablika party uh, candidates in 2012, uh, for example, or uh, certain uh, certain hardship that uh, independent candidates faced uh, last year in 2019. Uh, overall, representatives of uh, the opposition have been able to successfully register over the last seven years. So the problem is not in uh, registration, the problem is more in uh, lack of uh, interest and lack of uh, uh, self-confidence. Uh, um, so, Yulia, if I could... It is also, it is, uh, yes, uh, I'm, I'm, um, I'm coming to the conclusions. Uh, it is also not that expensive uh, to uh, participate in municipal elections. Uh, our estimate was that uh, 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 the participation, the campaign costs about $2,000 uh, for, for a candidate. And uh, our estimation was that uh, in the is, is that in the future, uh, up to three thousand opposition candidates could be elected annually in the next uh, five years, or well, in the next four years, uh, in uh, by two thousand and twenty twenty four. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, the most uh, and, uh, and a very important point here, uh, analyzing election campaigns in Moscow in 2007 and in St. Petersburg and in uh, 2019, um, uh, it, uh, these two campaigns show that uh, uh, when this, um, uh, when the uh, tactical voting and voter mobilization initiatives are used are in place, uh, they uh, largely uh, increase uh, the chances of independent uh, of independent candidates. Uh, unfortunately, uh, both campaigns led to government efforts to keep opposition candidates off the ballot. You know, when uh, when the official when the government realized that uh, people were were successful in their uh, in their uh, in, in getting the uh, the seats, uh, they they, uh, they the government started to uh, uh, to sabotage their registrations and uh, to uh, to use different techniques to techniques to keep them away from uh, from the uh, from the campaign. 
and uh, the and uh, in, uh, according to our data, uh, what the government really uh, tries to avoid is not uh, is not people getting to power as municipal deputies because they, they are quite limited in power. Uh, but uh, they are trying to avoid people getting political exposure. And this is exactly why we are trying to uh, mobilize uh, people to, uh, to participate in municipal elections. This is the easiest, this is probably the only accessible nowadays uh, start of a political career. This is how people get exposed, this is how people get skilled. Uh, in political process, this is how people get involved and get uh, and get into political participation, the real, the actual political participation. And this is what the government tries to uh, tries to avoid by all means. And uh, yes, and we we consider that uh, every uh, every political force, would it be a party or a movement, should uh, participate if they want to be visible at the Russian political sphere. Mm -hmm. So, Julia, picking up where, where you left off there, uh, with the mm -hmm. question of the government trying to, uh, to a certain extent, su suppress people's ability to build a political profile by running for local elected office, I think uh, the, the surprising result of your research for a lot of people will be that in a country as repressive as Russia, in a country where politics are controlled as tightly as Russia, it is possible uh, and uh, without any, you know, superhuman effort to to run for and win local elected office. Uh, and to just give a little bit more background for the audience on a couple of things you mentioned there. Uh, but anyone who's not aware, in 2017 in Moscow, and then again in 2019 in St. Petersburg, there were coordinated mm -hmm. opposition efforts. Um, Anastasia was part of the one in St. Petersburg last year, and we'll have her talk about that more in a minute. But there are coordinated mm -hmm. opposition efforts to kind of overcome a lot of the administrative barriers that have been put into place to prevent people from running. And they were quite successful in both cases, uh, you know, opposition, uh, of independent candidates or candidates from uh, non-systemic opposition parties won, you know, between 200 to 300 seats uh, in these uh, municipal bodies that have 1,500 seats. But it has given them a success significant voice in the politics of those two cities, which is no small thing. Um, but as Yulia was saying, one of the largest barriers that still remains to this is just a uh, level of interest. You know, there just aren't candidates running for these offices. You know, you say like a lot of cases, uh, even United Russia struggles to find a candidate for some of these seats, you know, uh, even the party of power. But um, there just aren't a lot of independent candidates uh, running for office, and it's understandable with the the limited powers of the office and all the kind of uh, official trouble that goes along with that. But Julia, I want to start off by asking you, what do you think can be done to you know, raise the level of, of interest among potential mm -hmm. independent candidates for local office in Russia? Mm -hmm. Well, I think uh, electoral mobilization projects such as United uh, Democrats, uh, for example, uh, is a great uh, is a great start. Uh, the problem uh, with uh, with the municipal elections that people do not uh, realize that they can participate in political process. They uh, they think it is uh, it is uh, too complicated. And uh, this uh, and such project as uh, United, uh, United Democrats, they encourage uh, people to participate, and they also provide uh, help with all these bureaucratic matters because it, it really is a skill. And Russian people are not really skilled in, in, in this. We were ta we were taken taken we were kept away from politics for such a long time that uh, we just don't have it in uh, in us. We don't have this knowledge, and it's 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 great that this. Um, organizations are providing uh, are pro providing practical help. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's a good place to, to turn it over to Anastasia. Um, and if you could take a, a couple mm -hmm. minutes, Anastasia, and just explain a little bit for the audience about what the United Democrats Project is, uh, kind of what the main challenges that you're helping potential candidates with are, and what your experience was like in, in 2019 in St. Petersburg, what were the challenges? What were the successes? What do you think you learned from your campaigns there last year? 
Uh, hello, uh, thank you so much. I'm a coordinator of United Democrats. So our initiative helps uh, independent candidates uh, to who share democratic values for sure to run and win in municipal elections in Russia. Uh, so uh, we had a successful campaign in 2019 in St. Petersburg. Uh, about 140 uh, candidates became, uh, became uh, deputies, municipal deputies, and now they are so popular in their territory and uh, so they have a, a support from uh, citizens. And now, uh, this time, United Democrats project uh, is been realized in four Russian regions. It's uh, Tatarstan Republic, then Ivanova, Vladimir, and Novgorod regions. Uh, so uh, we are focused on uh, not only on uh, regions' capitals, but in small, uh, on small cities and villages too. Uh, so how it works, uh, United Democrats, first of all, is not a political party. Uh, we have independent candidates, including member of opposition political parties and uh, for candidates who, um, who are not members of any parties. Uh, and uh, so first of all, we collect applications uh, from people who want to run to local offices. So the next step is interviewing. Um, so we have such kind of democratic filter. Um, and uh, so we can support just candidates who are following our values, uh, separation of power, rotation, transparency, human rights, etc. Uh, at uh, the same time, we teach uh, candidates to manage their own election campaign. And uh, so after that, we create a resource center. We have CRM system, uh, which allows to work with a huge number of candidates uh, and minimize costs for specialists. Uh, we so provide uh, legal support and uh, so help people to do uh, your digital documents correctly. Uh, and uh, agitation uh, materials like newspapers, um, and so uh, other print materials uh, to do design and do a uh, good text uh, because so um, as you said the municipal uh, municipal campaign is not a campaign with huge budgets or whatever uh, that's why so candidates need just money for print their agitation and so that's all uh, and uh, during uh, election campaign, our deputies in St. Petersburg, for example, had faced it with uh, some administrative pressure. Uh, election commission commissions uh, used some uh, illegal methods, like uh, they invite fake candidates to stay in turn during all the day, and uh, independent candidates have no ability to apply. Uh, before the end of working day, and uh, so it, it was day to day, uh, and uh, so some commissions didn't publish the election decisions. As a result, uh, independent candidates have just four or seven days to apply and uh, collect signatures. Uh, it's very so a uh, very short time for this. If I, can, uh, if I can jump in real quick, just to, to describe in a little bit more detail what Anastasia was talking about, mm -hmm. there was this kind of farcical uh, project in St. Mm -hmm. Petersburg last summer when independent candidates were trying to register. The Central Election Committee in the city was hiring fake candidates to come stand in line at the Election Committee's office and to just jam the lineup the whole day so that you had, uh, you know, actual independent candidates getting up at four in the morning and going and, you know, already the office would be packed and there was just, you know, they were pulling out some really ridiculous tricks to try to keep people off the ballot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, and uh, moreover, we had faced with uh, falsification of documents. Some commissions added some symbols to the list of water signatures. Uh, what are signatures and uh, cancelled candidate registration uh, registration so uh but uh, more or less we had so uh successful uh campaign and uh, so 
the main trait of this project that we can so we attract more than 70 percent candidates who uh, didn't take uh, part in any parties or so political organization before it's uh, new faces uh, in politics and we can uh, invite uh, them and so they become candidates and i can say that uh, this municipal power uh it's a, it can be a new power in russia so mm, yeah it's, it's Stasi, a, let me ask might... you a little bit about uh yeah. about candidate recruitment um you mentioned earlier that you're working now in four new regions of russia kind of mm -hmm. uh, mid-sized regions not too far out uh into into the sticks you know no good what is the what is your process there like for recruiting candidates and who are the people who are signing up to participate in this? Like, what kind of what kind of background do they have uh, professionally, personally? Why are they interested in doing this? Uh, so the middle age is about thirty five, uh, and uh, so it's totally different background of candidates. Some of them had uh, some uh, project, local projects, uh, so eco ecological projects or. So for um, some other in initiatives, uh, some of them uh, had some business uh, background, and uh, so now nowadays they want to help to their territory to uh, be better. Uh, and uh, some are very young people who have uh, so a lot of energy to change something. And uh, yeah, it, it's really different people, but uh, they. Uh, have the same values, democratic values, and want to uh, change their territory and uh, so uh, don't want to be a part of corruption of United Russia. So that's a common uh, thing, why, why they participate in our project. And another question maybe for uh, both Yulia and Anastasia. Um, I'm thinking back to last summer in Moscow, the, the events around the city Duma elections there, the kind of high profile refusal to register, uh, well, Lyubov Sobol probably most notably, and many other potential opposition candidates. Uh, to my mind, that raises a strategic question about this whole effort of trying to win power or create political pluralism by challenging for a local elected office. It seems that there's uh, right now a ceiling that the Kremlin is imposing on where people are allowed to win office. So you have all these independent candidates in at the municipal de deputy level in Russia, but when some of them try to take the next step up and run for city Duma, uh, that is uh, that door is slammed shut pretty quickly. And we've seen similar things with you know whatever. Uh, Oppositionists have been able to win executive office in Russia. You know, I'm thinking of in recent years, Yevgeny Roisman or even Urvashov uh, uh, and Yaslavl. Those stories haven't been particularly successful. The Russian government seems to have a pattern of, you know, quickly cracking down as soon as anyone has any electoral success, basically beyond the municipal deputy level. Do you think it's feasible to have a strategy? Um, that relies on kind of building power from the ground up in this way if any advances are going to be cut off like that well, let, let's let me stress uh, one uh, point uh, at uh, moscow uh, city duma elections uh, what uh, uh, important uh, uh, the sheer participation uh, in the electoral campaign was important, even if it did not lead to to the actual office. Uh, people, candidates uh, who participated in the campaign, they got uh, they got to be politicians <laughs> in the aftermath of this of this of that mayhem, and uh, this might be even more important uh, than the actual fictional uh, uh, deputy deputy office. But uh, I would like to hear Anastasia's opinion on that. Uh, so, in fact, it's uh, first of all it's different level that Moscow do my regional level, but not not, not municipal. Uh, but so uh, it's 
In fact, because of big territory, it's uh, almost impossible to find resources and so candidates even for ruling party. It's more than uh, five, uh, two, sorry, two hundred uh, thousand uh, local deputies in Russia. So uh, the municipal elections, uh, it's a window of opportunities for opposition to be elected and start their political career. And so after that, uh, try to run to regional offices and whatever. And if you have a background as a municipal deputy, you have uh, some support and territory. And uh, as, as you see, for example, Ilya Yashin, uh, he he was a candidate to Moscow Duma, and uh, he has strong support from uh, his voters because he's a municipal deputy, and so any citizens uh, who live in his area uh, know him and support him on uh, the next level to regional Duma. So uh, it's a, like a first step, first step in politics, uh, and uh, yeah. Okay, at this point, as long as we're talking about long-term strategy, uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Dr. Panea uh, and and ask uh, in the on the big picture uh, right now. Everyone, the the main question in Russian politics right now is, of course, the upcoming uh, referendum on changes to the constitution, and with that, the question of what's going to happen with Putin and the presidency after twenty twenty four. So. I know there's a lot of uncertainty and I, you know, never I try to avoid asking anyone to make any predictions, but I was hoping you could talk about where these different potential big picture developments might leave the strategy of uh, contesting municipal elections. So it seems to me that there, there's a different scenarios here. On the one hand, uh, you know, if, if, if Putin decides to stay in power, we could see a further crackdown and you know additional resources devoted to preventing opposition from building power on the local level on the other hand there's always the possibility that you know uh an end to putin's political career could mean increased uh political competition at the highest levels of russian politics no matter what that looks like it could open up some more space for opposition activism and opposition campaigning at the local level uh so uh, i'd be interested to hear your thoughts on you know, potential big picture scenarios for the next few years and what it means for this phenomenon that uh yulia and anastasia have been discussing uh so in fact i suppose that um one of the oh, sorry, um, i was trying to bring in uh bring in ella here if uh Ella, if, if you, if you want to speak to that. Sorry? I, th Ella, I think you're, you're muted, maybe. Mm -hmm. Ella, can you try unmuting? Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's an honor to speak here. And um, there are some changes uh, that make uh, sort of more uh, plausible to assume that people are going to be willing to participate in municipal elections. First, uh, during last years, uh, the amount of social capital in Russia grew up despite all the efforts of government people have more social ties and they have more diverse networks and they are sort of more socially embedded than they used to be and they also accumulate uh, the skills needed for mobilization usually the problem with uh, russian people being apolitical is not that much that they lack enthusiasm or they don't care but they actually lack the tools uh we lived uh, for 70 years in a society where any kind of grassroots 
mobilization had been criminalized or at least hardly harshly discouraged so it takes time just to learn how to do it how to be socially or politically active and uh, now people sort of learn it and of course uh, the dissemination of social networks help and uh, the technology helps and uh, the political regime is losing popularity and uh, losing legitimacy especially with the last economic crisis and the uh, epidemics uh, where sort of counter epidemic effort was less than satisfactory from the viewpoint of many people who thought before that uh, even if uh, the regime is not that good for sort of good times at least we uh, agree to have this authoritarianism because it's good for mobilization it, it it's good for uh, mobilizing quickly when we have problems and now it has been demonstrated that it isn't uh, so there is hope that people are going to be willing and even more importantly able to mobilize for next elections but at the same time we don't know how much the risks are growing because when an authoritarian regime loses its uh, other sources of legitimacy, it tends to become more repressive, and we can see it uh, right away. And second, we do not know how much the procedure is going to change. Uh, I appreciate the predictions made by the authors of this very interesting paper. But these predictions seem to uh, be based on an assumption that the regime sort of reached its, its cap for manipulation. And uh, two months ago, I would agree with it. But now the voting, the sort of constitutional voting we have now is going on on a very different set of procedures that allow for unpredictable amount of manipulation. Uh, it's much harder to organize control. Uh, it's much easier to simply falsify the data or mobilize some groups of uh, the population and demobilize others. Uh, and uh, right today we hear like right uh, today means today this day uh we heard um several statements from several high federal officials uh saying that uh, you know it's a, it's a good procedure why don't we uh use it for further elections and if so I'm afraid it's going to be uh, sort of a very different set of uh, prerequisites to to win or at least to get registered. That's a, a important, I think, sobering point. Uh, and on the topic of uh, COVID in the election, we have a couple of really interesting audience questions. One on the effect of the COVID pandemic on the elections. I don't looking forward to getting to but i also want to make sure that we get to uh larry diamond and i think uh it, i'd like larry to talk about an interesting point that you raised where it seems like there's uh kind of uh a built-in challenge to this approach of contesting power in authoritarian state by starting with local elections and working your way up as you said and as we've seen in russia it seems like an authoritarian country even if it doesn't necessarily have resources to control the electoral process everywhere at the local level, particularly in a big country like Russia, it does have the resources and the political will to crack down on anyone who gets too successful through these processes. So 
Larry, I wanted to ask you to discuss um, in comparative perspective your thoughts on this strategy for challenging an authoritarian regime, whether there's any kind of successful case studies of opposition movements in authoritarian countries taking this approach to building power and whether there's anything to learn from those cases for the Russian one. Yeah, well, um, I'd say <clears throat> logic is strongly on the side of it because you got to start from somewhere. Um, there are really only three paths to a uh, democratic uh, transition. You either um, build, use the space that is made available to you to begin to build alternative parties, alternative networks, uh, nonviolent civil resistance, and um, begin to nibble, nibble away <clears throat> at the regime's hegemony. And as uh, I think all three speakers alluded to, create capacity, skills, political visibility among um, emergent opposition figures. Or you hope that there's um, some disaster that leads to a revolutionary moment uh, and, you know, spontaneous organization of civil society, uh, like the Arab Spring. But, you know, the Arab Spring didn't work out so well in most of the Arab countries. <clears throat> and if you don't have the infrastructure of organization and coordination uh, and some emergent opposition figures, it's very hard to sustain. And even in Egypt, having had people who did go through um, the elections the regime allowed in some cases helped. And then the third is you can hope that there's a split in the regime uh, and uh, one faction will break away and you'll get some moderates who maybe will overturn uh, or push out a hardline incumbent, and in that way you get some beginning of a transitional process. But when you rely <clears throat> on factional divisions within the ruling elite, first of all, th they may not surface or they may be squelched and suppressed by the um, ruler, in this case Putin, who has certainly shown pretty good and domineering survival capacity at that level of elite politics. You know, even if you get lucky and the, and the ruler stumbles, dies, whatever, there's no guarantee that the next one will be any better. It could be worse. So um, I think if you look at some of the lessons um, from some transitions in under the military in Brazil over a long period of time in Taiwan, where the opposition started with local elections um, because that's all that was available to them. And in fact, for a long time, <clears throat> all that was available to them was running for local office on a non-party basis. They weren't allowed to organize an opposition party, but still they used the space to do some of the things uh, that Yulia and Anastasia and Ella have spoken of, which is, um, first of all, you prepare a new generation of politicians. You give them skills in running for office in presenting an image, in, um, in organizing, um, in dealing with issues. You connect them to one another so you build networks, even if they're independent candidates. Um, they can find common ground 
I think the project to connect uh, independent networks that Anastasia is involved in is very imaginative and, and very important because you never know when space is going to open more broadly because of a political crisis, the death of a ruler, uh, whatever it might be. And then the opposition has to ask itself, is it ready to take advantage uh, of, of the crisis? Or could the fact of its slow, patient, methodical building of organization and cultivation of skills, knowledge, visibility of um, opposition candidates, some of whom become, you know, municipal councillors or whatever, could that graduate to the point where it stimulates pressure on the regime? Beyond the organizational elements are the psychological elements that when you start winning elections, even a few elections, even elections at a level of authority that seems very non-consequential, you give people hope and you give the candidates hope that their efforts can pay off. And um, the system doesn't look as, um, as uh, formidable and hegemonic and unassailable as it once did. So, and by the way, I think that the path to sustainable democracy under colonial rule, uh, certainly in India, Sri Lanka, Jamaica, and so on under, under British colonial rule in a few African countries was made more viable by having uh, had initially uh, competitive municipal elections so that people begin again to get experience in contesting for office and in representing constituencies. And then over time, as space emerges, that can graduate and get networked uh, into uh, broader experiences and voters get experience in voting for something other than ritualistic exercises of cynical affirmation of the party of power. Uh, and they're able to look at uh, challenging candidates and again, uh, get registered and, you know, become slightly more discriminating and uh, empowered citizens. So, you know, we don't want to overstate this. It's a grim situation in Russia. It's a system that I think is obviously, you know, dramatically more hegemonic uh, and um, less free, more repressive than it was 15 or 20 years ago. But the lesson <clears throat> of democratic transitions elsewhere in the world is that you use what space is made available and you act creatively, uh, patiently, methodically, and sometimes uh, with the advantage of a low profile to gradually build these skills, networks, experience, understanding, visibility, uh, and to put forward some people who can gain some experience and then jump to the next level when the opportunity emerges. So, um, uh, and, and by the way, one other thing, even if these candidates are pushed out of being able to compete by shenanigans and manipulation at the local level, even if they're rigged out of victory or repressed, every time the regime is forced to use these techniques, it's costly. Repression is costly. Fraud is costly. It damages the regime's reputation. So even forcing them to do that 
I think can have some advantages in undermining the legitimacy of the regime. Great. Uh, thanks, Larry, for a surprisingly uh, optimistic take. And, and I think it is worth taking into account the kind of the, the political cost of shenanigans. Um, I wanted to go back. Uh, we've got about 15 minutes left, uh, and we've got several great audience questions that I want to make sure we have time to get through. So uh, first on the question of COVID, uh, Ella had mentioned how uh, the federal government's uh, response in Russia to the coronavirus crisis has been largely seen as inadequate and even to the point where it's maybe undermining the political legitimacy of the regime to a certain extent. On the other hand, it poses a lot of practical challenges as I think we're seeing around the world for uh, normal politics, for campaigning, for elections. So a question from an anonymous at attendee here is, could COVID-19 have any effect on local elections? For the constitutional plebiscite, the government seems to be doing everything they can to increase voter turnout despite the pandemic, including letting people vote online. Could we see a similar government election strategy on the local level? And do you see the government using new and creative ways to block independent candidates from running? Maybe I'll throw that one to uh, to Yulia or Anastasia. Mm -hmm. Sure, thank you, Dylan. Uh, uh, as I uh, as I heard, uh, the uh, some uh, some municipal elections are being postponed at the moment uh, because of the COVID. Um, and uh, yes, this is the worst uh, thing that uh, so far uh, happened uh, at, the, at this level. But I think that the, the real threat is uh, coming not from uh, the p pandemic situation, but uh, from the co uh, co new constitutional amendments. So there are a couple, there are several uh, amendments. Um, uh, as, you, as you know, there is a whole package, a portfolio uh, of amendments that uh, Russian citizens are at the moment uh, voting for. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, or against. Uh, and uh, about like, three or four uh, amendments uh, mention uh, local government uh, reform. And uh, an important um, an important um, uh, change that they br that uh, that they bring is that um, uh, they mention that uh, local government and uh, municipal le elections will be part of a, a unified system, uh, wh whatever that means. Uh, again, without any any clar clarification on this point. And the second thing that they mentioned that uh, municipal elections will be governed by federal laws. And the uh, thing is, we don't know what these federal laws will prescribe. Uh, so, um, well, my prediction would be that uh, uh, nothing will uh, change dramatically, like immediately tomorrow <laughs> after the, the constitutional amendments are accepted or rejected. Uh, but uh, the government lays ground uh, for future, uh, you know, for themselves to have more control of the future of municipal elections. And we have no idea what these federal laws will, uh, will allow for. It's worse than COVID. <laughs> um, another audience question I, I wanted to get to uh, is from Charles Levin, and it's about uh, the role of independent media. So the question reads, uh, for any of the panelists, what is the role of what is left of the independent media in Russia in promoting democratic municipal elections and promoting democratic politics overall? Can anything be done to strengthen broaden the independent media. So that last part is, of course, a perennial question for, for those of us working for more democratic politics in Russia. But maybe uh, we could focus, uh, and I go specifically to Anastasia on this one, uh, what is the role of independent media in enabling these kind of opposition campaigns? Um, and would a stronger independent media environment in Russia make a meaningful difference in the ability of your project and of opposition or democratic candidates to contest elections? So, for example, our project is not on a stop list in media, 
for sure we so uh, we can't uh, give an information to federal media but we have some uh, so small resources uh, media resources in regions and uh, so we are not blocked on it and for example i was about one week ago on uh, so ivanova regional television is the biggest media in region and so we had an interview about the project and uh, i can say that we have faced it with some so some problems in regional media for sure we can't uh, so to present our project in federal level but uh, yeah some local media always uh, so always like our information because it's interesting and it's real competition and uh, so it's not fake candidates but uh, it's people who so who are motivated and uh, so do some interesting things that's why uh so regional media sometimes so give our information about our campaign and our candidates that's interesting that it is i guess a relevant local news story of the sort that's unusual in Russia and could generate interest for audience. Um, so actually, I'm glad, I'd like to segue to that, uh, from that to uh, another topic, which I've gotten a number of questions on now. Um, the questions, I'll kind of try and combine them. The several questions asking about the, the utility of campaigning on local and civic issues as opposed to federal issues. So. Uh, as you mentioned, Anastasia, a lot of the candidates you draw are people who have been involved in uh, civic projects, uh, environmental projects, that sort of thing. And I think it's, uh, you know, natural that they would campaign on these local issues that they've been active on in the past and build a constituency that way. Um, and it seems like there's, in fact, a lot of energy in Russia right now in this kind of grassroots civic activism. So I guess the, the question would be, um, is it possible for local candidates to run campaigns that are purely on these kind of local and civic issues without really getting into the thornier questions of national politics, without really being explicitly oppositional to the Putin regime? Essentially, is that is that a strategy? And I, I would leave this for, for any of our candidates. Is that a strategy that uh, local politicians can use to build constituency in the way that we've been discussing, without you know incurring the wrath of the the, the federal government, without drawing attention to themselves in a way that might provoke a crackdown? Well, I'll just say something on the basis of comparative experience, and maybe my colleagues will have something to say with respect to Russia. The most important um, obligation and goal of these local candidates should be to win. And uh, I think they're more likely to do so if they focus uh, and, and to evade repression, uh, if they focus uh, at least substantially on local issues uh and uh you know my kind of instincts as a political scientist uh tell me that you know you can't just make these local level elections uh a, a referendum on um national level administration people want the trash picked up people want public services people want environmental protection and so you've got to attend substantially, maybe not exclusively to those issues, or you're probably not going to be successful. And if it's just run as a referendum on Putin, uh, it's probably not going to work out too well. I, I, I would say, we have, I agree completely, uh, but I, I would say we have the problem on the different side. Uh, people who run for local offices do their best to stay on the local agenda as much as they can. But uh, the administration tends to politicize it. It's an effort of another side, of administration, of their 
opponents connected to United Russia uh, to make it political, to make sure that everybody understands that if you vote for this person, you vote for a member of an opposition, even where it's not true at all, and you are going to be treated like, uh, like an unloyal uh, region, unloyal municipality, and you are going to be punished exactly on the level of all these local services and problem solving. Uh, and the threat is real. They actually do it. I see. So the, the higher levels of government actually undermine local candidates by trying to hurt their constituents, essentially, with poor service delivery. Yes. Hmm, that's interesting. Uh, so we've got just a few minutes left. Um, Yulia, I want to give you the final word, if you'd like, uh, for just a minute to wrap up, uh, I guess, what you think the main takeaways are from your research and uh, what you think uh, is important for audience members to, to watch for on this issue going forward. Uh, sure. Well, I would like to probably uh, reiterate the points that I already mentioned. Um, uh, it is important to participate in uh, all kinds of elections and uh, local uh, municipal elections is the most obvious way for people to get involved in politics. This is the way to learn, uh, to get the skills uh, of uh, political participation, something that uh, those skills that we don't have in our DNA, unfortunately. Uh, it is uh, important to uh, cooperate with uh, uh, the electoral mobilization pro projects that uh, support uh, independent candidates. Uh, and uh, it, if, if you are representing any democratic force, if you, if, if you are standing for any, any agenda in, in Russia, you, 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 to become well known, to become prominent, to become visible, you definitely need to participate in municipal elections. Great. Um, okay, well, I guess we will we'll leave it there. I'd like to thank uh, all of our panelists, especially Yulia, for this really great report that I, I do recommend to everyone. Is, it, is the whole thing coming out in English? Uh, uh, well, you have the uh, main key key points. Probably you could you could disseminate it to the participants. So. Great, thank you. I didn't, didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but I, I do encourage uh, uh, audience members to seek this out and read this. I, I thought it was really great. Um, thank you, Ella. Thank you, Anastasia. Uh, and good luck with your future efforts in uh, Ivanova and Tatarstan, wherever else you might be headed. Um, thank you, Larry, for joining us and for your perspective as always. And I am going to turn this back over. Uh, thank you to everyone in the audience. I'm turning this back over to Ambassador John Hertz, Director of the Eurasia Center, to uh, close out this event. Dylan, Dylan, thank you for moderating this panel. Dylan, thank you for moderating this excellent discussion. And I'd like to thank our guests from Moscow, Yulia especially, uh, actually from London, but our, and also a guest from Moscow uh, for a wonderful presentation and Dr. Diamond for providing historical perspective. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us. And I highly recommend this report, which is the, the short version of the report is, is out in English and it's available to all of you. And the long version is also worth a close read um, in the future when it comes out. Thank you all. And thank you to our hosts, our, our uh, partners. Thank you. Thank you, Dylan. Thank you, Dylan.